Okay, yeah, so I'm very I'm very interested in hearing more from you about uh, these parts and what they're all about. But in particular right now, I think I'd like you to maybe explain a little bit more on what you mean when you're like, oh, we used to you know, uh, pathologize parts. So what I'm thinking, like dissociative identity disorder or what used to be called multiple <clears throat> personalities. And you're suggesting that essentially everybody has some form of, you know, quote, multiple personalities um, and that it's not necessarily a disorder until it is dysfunctional and causes uh, like a uh, negative impact in our lives in some way. I, I, am I correct there? Absolutely. That's exactly our view. Uh, and that's what I say oftentimes when I teach. Hi, when I teach, hello, you guys, you're here and you're all going to leave with the diagnosis of multiple personalities because I believe we all have it. You know, um, we all have multiple personalities. We all have multiple parts. Um, we do think of them, honestly, as these little people within us, these little entities. Um, you know, they, the, you know, I've worked with uh, the folks over at Pixar. I think I may have mentioned this to you during my talk. Um, the Inside Out movie, for example, is the perfect depiction of what we mean by parts. Okay, we all have these little aspects of us that hold different things and they're like little people in there the thing is they get they express themselves in varying ways for example one part may express itself through a feeling another part may express itself through a physical sensation another part may express itself through um a thought all right but we all have them and they're all normal i would i think of them as aspects of our personality OK, I could be funny. I could be laid back. You know, I could I have all different aspects of who I am. OK, and this is the the way I think about parts, aspects of our personality. <clears throat> Tell people, you know, I'm different when I'm jumping on the trampoline with my kids than I am when I'm in my office working. Those are different aspects of my personality or different parts. It's when they have to take on extreme roles is when it becomes problematic because of life experience. For example, you can have somebody who loves to read, okay? And because of neglect or verbal abuse in their household, they can use reading books in a way to get away from pain. So they read in this excessive, um, deliberate, intentional way for a function of getting away from pain. So it gets overused, it gets overworked in a way that then, in some ways, is trying to protect from pain. Um, and so, in our view, parts are normal, we all have them. It's when they have to take on these extreme roles that they become problematic, right? Whether it's protective, like I'm gonna read 10 hours a day so I don't have to feel, it's what we call a protective part, or, when they have to carry a wound, I'm no good, I'm, love, I'm unlovable, I'm worthless. That's what we call a wound. So parts can either, in this um, overworked or, or harmful way to the system, they can either protect in an over-functioning way or they can carry a wound which needs to be pushed away, pushed away, pushed away so you can survive. Mm -hmm. So as, as as much as the parts can can be like wide in many, many, many parts and the issue comes when they take on extreme roles like so for example, if I if I learned to read so I didn't have to connect with the stress of my childhood environment, when I get older and I use reading as a way to like relax and unwind and check out from the world, that's fine. But when yes. I cannot go outside, I can't form healthy relationships because the reading is a way that I'm protecting myself from this other part of me that's deeply wounded, that sees that it. the the world is unsafe. And so I become whatever. I, I do things that aren't healthy introverted behaviors. I do things that kind of stop me from having healthy social connection and social support and maybe even, I don't know, many no a number of consequences. So there are all these different parts and they serve different roles, but you've also managed to, in IFS, differentiate very specific parts. So it's not like yeah. just a total free-for-all in there. There's sort of um, 
there are categories of parts. Maybe or maybe you have a better language for it. You have protector parts, which are divided in two different types of parts, and then you said wounded parts, which I believe, if I remember correctly, is what you call an exile. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, the languaging is something that's been a, a bit problematic for us, honestly. And Dick is somebody who just organically evolved this model. He just listened to people. He's been doing this for 40 years. And these words just kind of organically come up. Protective parts, one of two forms. One we call a manager. The other one is called a firefighter. So two kinds of protective parts. I'm personally trying to move away from that language because people get a little bit like, what? What are you talking about? Like, I'm a school teacher. I'm not a firefighter. Why do you keep calling me a firefighter? So I like to talk about the two kinds of protective parts, for example, the ones we call managers. I like to think of preventative parts. They work hard to prevent bad things from happening. OK, they're at the front ends. You know, I'm going to be liked. I'm going to work hard and do a good job. So my boss will be happy. Um, I'm going to work hard. So everything everybody's plea, you know, everything goes smoothly. They work hard on the front end to prevent bad things from happening. I'm going to be funny. So everybody likes me, this kind of thing. Um, the other kind of firefighter or extreme part that we call, I like to call those extreme or reactive parts. Those parts are protective also, but they jump in to stop the pain once the wound's been triggered. So these two protective parts, two protective parts, the managers work hard to prevent bad things from happening. And then the firefighters jump in, put out the fire, if you will, once the wound has been triggered. All right, I'm going to stop this no matter what. Okay, so those are the two kinds of protective parts, managers or firefighters. The other one is the wounded parts or exiled parts, the ones that carry the pain or hold the pain. Um, and those categories of parts usually get pushed away by protectors. You know, this is the way our psyche survives is keeping pain away. You know, I even go back to like cavemen time, touch the fire, it hurts. Okay, let's not touch the fire. And it's kind of like that, that we keep our pain exiled or pushed away. Um, so the thing that you that is another really important piece in IFS is really being mindful, even though on the surface, all these parts might look problematic or pathological, they really all have positive intentions. OK, they're really trying hard to help the system survive. And you always keep that in mind. Um, it's harder for people to do that, for example, with the firefighters, okay? Somebody who's shooting heroin or drinking all the time or cutting, you know, these like suicidal, depression, these extreme parts. Yes, those even have a positive intention to protect the wound. It's hard for people, it's hard for therapists to kind of wrap their head around that. But it's one of the things that's really important is that we love up these parts for their positive intention. Same thing with the wound. Most people want to push away their pain. Move forward. Move on. Forget about it. It's in the past. We don't do that. You know, we were, thank you so much for carrying this. You're holding an important function for this system. So we love up the parts for their intention, not their effect. Most of mental health, most of society and culture focuses on the effect of the part, not on their intent. And we do that differently in IFS. Mm -hmm. So then let's say that uh, a person comes, well, let's use the same, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, use the same uh, example of the person reading. Um, so mm -hmm. a person comes in and they have what might be an extreme uh, response. Um, okay, so the, so they're cutting themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And then they come in and they're there because they're cutting themselves. And so maybe in an IFS session, session, you might say that the act of cutting is is the firefighter. That the yeah. manager says, okay, well, just keep a distance from people um, because you know, like because interacting with others at some point meant extreme pain. Or whatever it might mm -hmm. be. So, like, uh, if you know, if if I let someone in, um, I will 
I will feel worthless. So if I let anyone in, I will feel worthless. So I'll stay checked out of my own life by reading all the time. That's the manager. Okay, we'll keep the pain away. But then yeah. somebody happens to ask this person out on a date and all of a sudden someone's yeah. trying to get in. The reading isn't helping anymore. The firefighter steps in and the cutting happens. The cutting is also happening to protect that person from a history of pain, some trauma that's left over from them by making like bringing the pain up to the surface of the skin. They don't have to feel worthless because they feel the sensation of the blade in their skin or something. Yeah, and somebody exactly. comes into an IFS session and says, I'm cutting myself. And you might throughout the process of it, start to understand that that's sort of the larger system at work. Does that, does that about right? Absolutely. That's exactly right. And you know, that's one of the ways that it's so divergent from kind of more typical or traditional mental health services. Because if somebody comes in saying, I'm cutting constantly, you know, what typically happens, certainly here in the States, you know, is you fill out a treatment plan and you say, okay, we're going to stop your cutting in 10 sessions. <laughs> okay. So the insurance company will reimburse us and that's the goal. We don't do that in IFS. We're like, oh, you're cutting. That's awesome. Tell me more about it. Okay. Like we just jump right in and want and really get curious from the therapist's point of view with positive curiosity. Like, wow, cutting, how does it help? Tell me more about it. You know, and you'll learn, you'll learn like sometimes it's like, you know what, when I cut, then I can go to the emergency room and people take care of me when they stitch up the wound. So I get care and nurturing or, oh my goodness, when I cut, you know, it helps me get away from my emotional pain and focus on the physical pain. Or it makes me rise up, another part of me jump in and take care of the wound. So there's all these different positive functions of cutting. And that's where we jump into, you know, we don't do this, you know, I don't think cutting's a good idea. Let's see if we can eliminate it. Why don't you do yoga instead? Okay. <laughs> like we don't do that kind of, here's the, here's the parts of you I like, here's the parts of you society likes, why don't you focus on those? You know, it really, the part that cuts has this very like, oh, you don't want to help me. Don't tell me you want to help me when I'm telling you the way I'm helping and you're telling me to stop it. Mm -hmm. You're trying to take right? away my only thing. Yeah, you're trying to take away the most effective thing I have to cope. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so we do it differently. It's a, and, and for therapists, sometimes this is a hard shift because really you're taught to eliminate these symptoms, pathological symptoms, so everybody can be healthy. It's just not our approach. Suicide's a perfect example of that. You know, you're suicidal. Most people freak out and want to stop that. We really don't do that. Like, you know, if you think of the suicidal part, for example, as a part, I walk in and say, hey, I'm feeling suicidal. You don't want to hear, well, that's stupid. Stop that right away. Yeah, yeah. You know, as the suicidal part, you want to hear, wow. Okay, tell me more. I'm here to help. And and a few times I've supported friends in it coming down from a suicidal crisis. It's never like I mean generally the you know they wouldn't be reaching out if they really wanted to die, right? And it's like well, it's not that's that not true. A part does and a part doesn't. Well, you got to think this of is it what like I, that, this right? is what I mean yeah. is that both times or sorry, three times this has happened, it has yes. been something like I really want to kill myself right now. And that scares the hell out of me because I don't really want to kill myself right now. And it's like and, this and confusion. I, well, and for me, when I look at that, we, the way we break it down in IFS is a part of me wants to die. Interestingly enough, it's not really about killing myself. The part that wants to die is about stopping the pain. And it's got this ultimate way of doing that. Okay. And then there's another part that says, oh my gosh, I want to live life is important, I care about my parents, my kids, whatever, you know, my partner. So it's what we call a polarization. So there's different parts with different views, you know, but people get all hung up like, oh my God, we have to stop the killing. But, you know, it's really most, you know, I don't, most suicidal parts don't want to die. They want to stop the pain and they don't want to be told, shut up or stop it. You know, anybody who is heard and validated relaxes. That's the same thing with suicidal parts. When they feel heard and validated, 
they calm down, they don't escalate. But most therapists are afraid to move towards the suicide, thinking, oh my gosh, if I focus on it, it's gonna grow. It's the opposite. It's like, oh my gosh, so you really wanna kill yourself? Tell me more about that. How is it helpful? What's good about it? Oh, that makes sense to me. So you're the ultimate last responder. Wow, what a job. That's a lot. Do you want help with that? And then the suicidal part goes, finally somebody gets me. Yes, I want help. Thank you for listening. And it calms down. Now you have a real working relationship. 